Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Way Back When History Show with Nancy and Lisa. You know us, the crazy mother-daughter travel team. We travel across the country documenting parks and public lands while publishing all kinds of magazines, including a new one called Way Back When, our history magazine, and of course, uh, podcasting. So today we're excited to welcome Jared R. Hardesty. He is an associate professor in the Department of History at Western Washington University. So we're going to geek out today. Just watch out here. Uh, he's also the author of three books. Uh, the first one, Unfreedom, Slavery and, the Depend and Dependence in 18th Century Boston. And the other book is Black Lives, Native Lands, White Worlds, A History of Slavery in New England. And he's joining us to talk about his latest book. It's called Mutiny on the Rising Sun, A Tragic Tale of Slavery, Smuggling, and Chocolate. It's involved in this. Mm -hmm. It's out now through uh, New York uh, University Press. But welcome, Jared. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. Yeah, we are too. And, and so this is like the mutiny and you really bring in smuggling and slavery. And this all really started uh, back what, June 1st? What what year? This is before 19, oh, excuse me, 1743 was really when this whole epic story happened, where it started. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So 1743. So we're talking, you know, uh, 40, uh, 43 years before there, or 33 years. Sorry, I'm a historian. I don't know that. Uh, before the, the uh, American Revolution. Uh, so there's no such thing as the United States yet. These are still colonies, uh, you know, colonists in the British Empire. Um, but it was, uh, it, but the, one of the remarkable things about this time period is just how commonplace smuggling was. It was every day, everybody engaged in it in one way or the other because of restrictive laws put in place by those empires, by the British or the Spanish or the French. And so this is a story that's um, on the one hand, uh, to us, remarkable, uh, but parts of it, uh, even parts of it that seem remarkable to us, say like the, the smuggling, would have been very everyday for the people who live in that time period. Wow. So how yeah. did that, you know, if you think about the smuggling going on and this really went down through, the ship went through uh, South America, here it is, mm. chocolate. You know, you think about all the Aztecs well, and yeah. everybody out there, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm sorry, bring it. <laughs> I'm not going to complain about you it. About the chocolate. It, <laughs> well, but, you know, we've done so many, I kind of look at where we are today, and you talked about these laws from the empires. In today's world, we've done so many shows on animal trafficking, human mm. trafficking, mm. and to me, they seem to go hand in hand, actually. And it seems the same thing in this story. So, I mean, we're talking a few hundred years, mm -hmm. and we're still having smugglers and it, trafficking going on. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, this is this is part of it. Is that, that there is a piece of this that is human smuggling. You know, slavery mm -hmm. and the slave trade was central to the smuggling ring that, that's at the center of, of Mutiny on the Rising Sun. And what what's fascinating about this time period, though, is that the, that part of it is actually it's not illegal to traffic people. The slave trade's plenty legal. What was illegal was taking those people across the imperial boundaries. So selling those captives from out of the British Empire into the into the Dutch Empire in South America in the colony of Suriname, that was the illegal act. But the actual act of trafficking was not. And so this is a world where the actual trafficking of certain people was totally and fully legal and and you know condoned uh, by uh, by by people in authority. Wow. Uh, sources of, see, see the sources of wealth. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the Dutch doing this, you know, we lived in South Africa for a number of years. Nancy had a magazine back there. And, you know, first thing to was a in school is the, the Dutch <laughs> East India Company. Mm -hmm. And I wonder about that, you know, because so many ships did try to go around the Cape um, mm -hmm. and did. And, you know, when you stand on the actual edge of, you know, the very tip of Africa and you watch the oceans collide, you're like, how mm -hmm. did you do that, man? It's crazy. I know, but that's crazy. So was there, was that kind of a connection at all in this story or just in the, you know, with, am I getting my, I'm getting my um, centuries wrong. I think they were back in the 1400s. I can't remember now. <laughs> I no, need to go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the same, it's about the same time period. So the uh, okay. the uh, East India Company is still active um, in the 18th century. It's, it will be around until, I believe, 1796. Um, 
and in that it's it's our, the Dutch eliminate or maybe a little bit like a couple years later. Um, but there's two companies the Dutch create the Dutch East India Company, which is in charge of trade to Asia, and then there's the Dutch West India Company, okay. uh, which is in mm-hmm. charge of trade in the on the in the Americas. And they 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 largely keep their business separate. Um, but the way that the Dutch Empire kind of worked in this country is that it's significant amounts of it are essentially privatized. They allow uh, or or kind of joint public private ventures. So they allow private companies, private families, private investors of all sorts um, to to create these companies. And so Suriname's a, a kind of fast what well, I should say fascinating kind of an interesting example of all this, where the the colony of Suriname, although officially a Dutch colony was actually operated by a private company called the Society of Suriname. But the Society of Suriname, <laughs> this, is just, this is layers. That's of, funny. It's, it's actually owned, uh, its, its main investors are the Dutch West India Company, uh, the city of mm-hmm. Amsterdam, the, the, the city itself is an investor, so that's the, the public part of it, and then a, a private family, the, the Van Sommelzijk family. And, and so there's these, and so this is the way that kind of Dutch empire works. So you're going to see, especially if you're like in Amsterdam or something, you're going to find the same people investing in the East India Company, the West India Company, in Suriname and, okay. and other places. Um, kind of, and and there's just a, it's a way of return on investment. I mean, you see a lot of overlap with, say, um, military officers or colonial officials will serve in one company and then end up in another company halfway around the world serving. So it's the beginning of our stock market and going public. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, Dutch are, the, the, the Dutch are pioneers in finance, finance and, and that's one way they do it through their uh, empire. Wow. wow. Well, this is amazing. So tell us a little bit about the mutiny part. What happened on June 1st? <laughs> <laughs> so what happened on June 1st? Well, so there's... The, we have a lot of details, but uh, we, like the conflicting stories and, and not full records. But what we know mm-hmm. is that this ship called the Rising Sun, um, and sometime about mid mid May 1743, um, it had departed from Barbados, the uh, a colony a colony in the in the British Empire in the in the Caribbean in the Eastern Caribbean, little tiny island, but a center of plantation production, growing sugarcane, using slave labor, and what's the, the, the Rising Sun's actually, although based in Barbados, registered in Barbados, um, and belonging to, in part to a Barbadian merchant by the name of Gedney Clark, um, was actually captained by a man from Boston, Massachusetts, um, and a number of its crew members were also from Boston. And there was also mm-hmm. a supercargo or merchant on board, also from Boston, whose name was George Ladane. And so the captain's name is York Jackson. And while in Barbados, um, the so Jackson had sailed to Barbados on some other ship. I'm not sure what the ship was called or its name or anything or when he arrived in Barbados. But then he's hired to captain the Rising Sun from Barbados to Suriname. And the, the Rising Sun was a bigger ship. And so he did not actually have the crew uh, to, so he hired crew members in Barbados. And he hired three men. Um, and they're, they're described in the records as uh, Portuguese sailors. Um, they were, uh, when you dig into it a little bit, they're it's a little more complicated picture. There's actually two of them are, uh, Portuguese speakers. One's from Portugal. Uh, another man, I, we're not, I'm not sure where he's from, but he is a mixed race. Um, so perhaps from, he could be from West Africa or Brazil or, or Portugal. Um, and the third man, um, is actually not Portuguese at all. He's Italian. Um, he's from mm-hmm. Venice. Um, but he's also mixed race. And these men were probably most likely uh, had served on board slave ships, slave ships that went from the West Coast of Africa to Barbados. Um, and slave ships, it's a nasty business, as, 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 you, as we've already kind of mentioned, it's a re- really nasty business. And, and part of it, in, in addition to being nasty to the captives, and, and one of the things, the, the captains are notorious for penny pinching. And so what they do is they're mm-hmm. discharged sailors in a place, like when they arrive in Barbados, they're they were forcibly discharged sailors. So then they can save on not having to pay their wages on the voyage home because they don't need as many crew members anymore to watch over the, the captives. And so my <laughs> guess is my 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 best oh, it's a nasty business. So you know from up and down. And so my my best guess is that these three men were uh, were had been discharged from a, from a, a slaving vessel, and and Jackson hires them to go to to Suriname. So the the Rising Sun um, is. Is, there's all sorts of cargo on board. There's uh, timber and salt fish from New England, probably some other things from New England. But the, the main cargo were a group of African captives who had recently arrived from, from West mm-hmm. Africa, from the Gold Coast, what's today, Ghana, I think. Um, put on board the ship probably 40 to, to 50 people. 
And then the ship took about a five day voyage from, from Barbados to, to Suriname. Mm -hmm. And when they arrived at Suriname, um, it's actually because they crossed imperial lines, they crossed from the, the British empire into the Dutch empire. It's actually illegal for them to be selling captives or be selling slaves there. So they have to wow. engage in some trickery. And so Jackson claims when they arrive in Suriname that they're in distress. They need water, they're out of water, they need wood to, to, fight, mm -hmm. to, to cook, and the ship is in desperate need of being recalked. It has to be sealed up because it's taking on water. This is all a claim, probably no truth to it. Uh, the, the governor of Suriname, is, uh, it's unclear his exact role in all this, but he's <laughs> suspicious, it seems. And so he actually makes, he allows the ship to land. He has to by treaty. Um, but he makes it dock at the port um, so it can keep a close eye on it. Um, over the next wow. few days, uh, over about the next week, um, Jackson and Ladane, the two, the captain and the merchant, uh, begin selling uh, captives illegally um, and they get caught. Uh, mm -hmm. At one point they get caught and soldiers are actually stationed aboard the ship, uh, but it doesn't seem to stop the commerce. Somebody's on the take. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're there for about a week. They actually do recalk the entire ship, although it didn't need to be recalked, but it made it look like it gave the appearance of doing some, of being there for the reason they're supposed to be there. And finally, the governor's quite angry after a week and orders them to leave. And so this would be May 31st, 1743. So they, uh, they, 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 uh, they leave, they dock uh, at the mouth of the river, they spend the night, take on some wood and water to, to go on. And their actual next destination was going to be another colony in South America called, what's today, French Guiana, uh, what was then called Cayenne, which is the capital, uh, which is to the, to the east. Um, and so they started on, on, the, on June 1st, the morning of June 1st, they start heading that way. Um, but it's very slow. Uh, these are sailing ships. They don't have engines, right? And, and they're, they're fighting currents and winds. This is a very slow motion. And so by the end of, uh, uh, um, by the end of uh, May 31st, um, they, and, and yeah, sorry, sorry, by the end of June 1st, um, about uh, 11 p.m., they're off the coast, they're heading eastward, and this mutiny happens. Um, the three, quote, Portuguese sailors uh, that I just talked about, um, snuck into the cab, uh, the captain's cabin, murdered the captain, uh, mm -hmm. or attacked the captain, attacked the, the merchant. Um, it causes just chaos on board the ship uh, as the, the captain and merchant, they get up on deck and there they are uh, finally uh, uh, dispatched by the mutineers. Um, the, the bosun or the boatswain who was in charge, uh, who was on, on watch at the time and kind of uh, piloting the ship, he, he flees after being cut, uh, being uh, 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 cut a couple times with the uh, swords. Um, oh. Yeah, oh, it's 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 nasty business. Um, mm -hmm. And it also wakes up the mate of the ship, the other officer on board the ship, who goes up. He was sleeping at the time, like I said, it's about 11 p.m. He was sleeping at the time. He goes up on deck to to see the merchant and the captain being uh, brutally attacked, and he's stabbed in the shoulder. And, and he so he lays on the deck and he watches this all happen. Um, meanwhile, the, uh, the merchant had a clerk on board. He's attacked and, and packed up and he crawls into the, and deep Dang. into the hold. No, oh, it's yeah. brutal. It's, it's brutal. It's really <laughs> it brutal. It's brutal. Nancy's it's, been it's, reading this and she's like, I can't like, believe this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's brutal. nasty, right? And, uh, mm -hmm. and the, I mean, the, we actually have pretty graphic descriptions, uh, because of the nature of record keeping about the mm -hmm. actual attacks. And so we know, for example, um, when Jackson, Jackson, the captain, he would, he'd been stabbed a few times. He got up on deck and he's laying on deck and he somehow, some way had grabbed an ax to defend himself, but he can't really move. He's kind of immobilized on the mm. deck. And one of the mutineers actually grabs the ax and, and just starts chopping at him. It, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really graphic. Um, but Are you sure this isn't a Halloween movie? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's just like this. It's just this like moment of sudden violent outburst mm -hmm. um, and that happened Crazy. kind of built built up. Um, and then they so they 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 murder the captain, or actually they they don't fully murder Jackson. He's they they take him and they throw him overboard. And at I least according to the to the, the mate, he's still alive because he falls into the water. So he actually would have drowned um, rather than die of his wounds. Uh, George Ladane did die of his wounds. Um, and so did the uh, the clerk who they find mm. and they 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 finish and, and throw him overboard as well. Um, the other the other victim there's a fourth victim murder victim in all this, and that was the the cabin boy who served. He's kind of he's kind of like an officer in training who served the cabin. His name was John Skinner, uh, probably about twelve or thirteen years old. Oh. He 
he yeah. oh, it's, oh yeah he he slept in the cabin mm-hmm. with uh with Jackson so he's very close with Jackson um probably he's like his apprentice so he, they slept in the same cabin and all this and uh he he gets away at first and he's so mm-hmm. scared he's a boy right he's so scared he goes up the shrouds of the of the mast which are these nets that connect to the mast mm-hmm. so you can get up to the top so he goes up the the, the shrouds. And the mutineers actually coax him to come down. Like they tell him they're not going to hurt him. They, they don't. Oh, and the boy. moment he, his feet hit the deck, they, they charge him and, and bludgeon him and throw him overboard as well. No, um, it's oh, not. And if you're and drowning is supposed to be really painful as well. Oh, oh it's, it, it would be horrible. These, they, these are horrible deaths. It, um, it's really the, bad. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's really bad. Um, mm. and, and so it left four, four other crew members alive on the ship the uh, the bosun whose name was john shaw the the mate whose name was william blake and two young sailors who we don't know a lot about one was named was uh, josiah jones the other named henry Deveries. uh the two young men they're probably about 19 or 20 years old this was perhaps their first sailing voyage ever Ooh. they were from from massachusetts mm-hmm. so this is they perhaps they never left coastal waters before and this is their first experience on the high seas um and like i said know very little about them um but uh, the but we know quite a bit more about the two officers, uh, Blake and Shaw, and it's, it's it becomes their responsibility at this point to kind of end the mutiny. Um, and so they, they what we're going to see, and I'm happy to talk about this more. Um, but they're going to be the ones that end the mutiny um, through some trickery and, and, and things uh, to to wrestle the ship back away from the, or, or wrestle control back from the three mutineers. Wow. It's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, normally, I think because the movie Mutiny on the Bounty that people, when you hear the word mutiny, you think, okay, the officers running the ship were really pretty cruel to mm-hmm. their shipmates. And so, or, you know, the people are starving and they're injured and mm-hmm. they mutiny because they, they're trying to survive mm-hmm. being on the ship, as opposed to these guys got on the ship going, ooh, let's mutiny. <laughs> Yeah, that, this yeah. Is the, the, yes, the real question is motive here, because if you if you look at these, in, in there, we have their testimony because of the way they meet the enemy. We actually have two of their testimonies. Um, so the, the Italian man um, whose name was um, Thomas Lucas and the, the Portuguese man whose, whose name was uh, Fernando da Costa, Fernando da Costa. And we, so we actually have their testimonies um, and what they say. And, and they actually say that we weren't mistreated. We were treated very well by Captain Jackson yeah. and George Ladane. They uh, they got paid Crazy. very well, like very mm-hmm. high wages by the standards of the time, and especially for sailors. That 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 wages that were even high by the standards of men who had quite a bit of uh, sailing experience. And so the question really that I that I wrestle with, we don't see uh, in the documents, is actually why? Why mm-hmm. would what kind of compelled them to do this? Yeah. And um, it, it's it's difficult. Um, the, part of the reason we don't know is that the when they're apprehended, um, the Dutch uh, government that prosecutes them, insert on the, the colonial government, has no interest in motive. They just want to prove guilt, and they want to they want to execute these guys. They want to make an example of them. That's and so the entire mm-hmm. case is just kind of proving guilt. So they're not particularly concerned. They just want to show that they did it, not why they did it. Um, and, and they're actually presumed mm-hmm. to be guilty. There's no presumption of innocence back in this time period, mm-hmm. um, especially in the Dutch legal system at the time. And and so for me it was like so what what's going on why would these men be compelled yeah. to do this they're treated they say they're treated well they say that they, they are, they're getting paid very well uh, what's what's going on well mm-hmm. from one of the things we do know is that from the testimony of the other crew members and from their own testimony is that they wanted when they seized control of the ship they wanted to go to Orinoco. Um, now, this is uh, in mm. what's today Venezuela, in the eastern part of the country, the Orinoco River. And the, the colony, the it's a Spanish colony um, at the time, and the Spanish had this policy in Orinoco that any runaway uh, slave, runaway soldier, runaway sailor who arrived there, if they were Catholic or they became Catholic and they pledged their loyalty to the King of Spain, they'd be welcome with open arms. Wow. And, and so they say, mm-hmm. I want to, you know, we want to go to Orinoco. Uh, I kind of wonder, you know, is this their attempt to go to a place where they're be welcome? They're already Catholic. Um, uh, they all say that the two men who do, they say they're Catholic. Um, it's pretty easy to pledge their loyalty to the King of Spain. Um, they speak a similar language, right? So, so perhaps this is their attempt to go there and set up shop. And if seizing control of the ship, which, it, which once it leaves Suriname, is full of a, a very valuable cargo of of, of chocolate, of sugar, mm-hmm. of coffee, 
a, something to sell, right? So they can actually- Sounds like might, a good ship to me. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, exactly. It's a yeah. great target, right? A great mark. There's quite a bit of money on board the, or the value on board the ship. Mm. Plus there are a few remaining captives on board, about uh, 15 remaining captives on board mm. and uh, quite a bit of gold and silver. I, I think that um, a number of the planters who bought captives off the Rising Sun and Suriname actually probably paid with gold or silver. And so they paid cat with cash. And so there's, so the, the ship itself is quite the mark. And so they, they could take that valuable ship and take it to Orinoco where there's a, where people probably aren't going to ask too many questions, then they might be able to make mm. a future for themselves. And, and so the question is, well, why, why are guys who are making, you know, making good wages, treated pretty well, why, yeah. why do they want to make a, a better life for themselves? And I think it actually comes down to the Thomas Lucas, the, the Italian man, uh, mm. the, the mutineer who I was talking about, uh, Lucas. Uh, Lucas is about 35 years old, um, which is an old man yeah, that's time period for a sailor, yeah. for a sailor. Um, <laughs> it, it, sailing life is really rough. It's really hard on mm -hmm. the body. And in fact, if you look at him, um, he, he by far has the most experience in his testimony. He says he's been at sea since he's about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. He had not been back to Venice in a decade. So he has, you know, decades of sailing experience, but he's actually paid less than the other two mutineers. Uh, his wages are lower, and he had to double to get the wage he did get. He had to double the ship's cook, which oftentimes was seen as the kind of lowliest position. Mm -hmm. And so it suggests that he's starting to age out of the only profession he knows, the only source of his his, his livelihood. So perhaps this is him trying to, you know, make a retirement, make get away, and you know, kind of build some sort of, you know, after uh, retirement, you know, for for himself. Um, and that's kind of my my best sort of speculation yeah. on, mm. on, on why this happened. It, you know, when you're reading it, it's like during the mutiny, it's like, okay, stab, stab, throw him overboard, stab, stab, throw him overboard, throw that one overboard. Oh, he's still, oh, who cares? Throw him overboard. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I mean, and I'm assuming that while this is happening, that the ship is still sailing, mm -hmm. or is it at a stop? I mean, you know, today you have Coast Guard and you have mm -hmm. other boats around you, but out there it's like there's a uh, throw overboard. Who's who's going to tell? And what's you in know? the water too? Like hello, yeah, well, dude. Like, <laughs> it's tropical water, so there, there's oh, there's, there's plenty of things in the water. There's, there's stuff there's, in the water. There's sharks. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, this is the thing, and this is actually what caused the mutiny to fall apart. Um, mm. What are the, I started to do quite a bit of research on. Um, what life was like for sailors, like what kind of just yeah. kind of regular sailors, like what what was their life like? What did they do? What did they what would what they know? And one of the things that, that came out was that most regular sailors, like the mutineers um, or the two other young men on board the ship, actually, while they knew how to hoist sails and work the sails, they actually didn't know how to pilot or navigate a ship. Yeah. And yeah. so they 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 lack this kind of wow. central piece of knowledge. Um, and, and so if they want to go anywhere, uh, once they commit the, the mutiny, that means they're relying upon the two ship's officers, the bosun, who's essentially in charge of all the cargo and kind of the foreman of all the, of, of all the sailors on board the ship, and the mate, who's the pilot navigator uh, of a ship. And, and so they're relying on these, these two men and their, and their knowledge, um, uh, uh, and especially this area. So the, the bosun's name is, uh, John, like I said, John Shaw. He has had uh, at least uh, five or six years of experience of sailing in this region. So he's very familiar with it. He speaks Dutch. Um, and, and so they need him, right? They need him mm -hmm. for his knowledge. Uh, uh, yeah. but, but of course, they have, the, the two officers have, have other ideas. And so you're, you're right. So the, this, the ship was mm -hmm. actively moving. They were actually in a mm -hmm. pattern that's called tacking, which requires mm -hmm. quite a bit of skill where you, get, you essentially do a zigzag pattern to yeah. fight against wind and current. And they're in, the, they're in a tacking pattern when the mutiny occurred. Mm -hmm. um, and so the ship has to goes, you know, has to stop. And then the question is, well, what, what, where do we, they need to go west. They need to go west to Orinoco. And so they ask the, the mate and the, and the bosun or demand or command mm -hmm. them, you have to take us west to Orinoco. And so they, okay, they say, yes, we'll do that. Um, it actually shouldn't have been that long of a trip. Um, mm -hmm. It should have been about a, a couple of days because there's, like I said, there's this current that runs along the northern coast of South America that they could have taken westward in mm. a couple of days and then just drop south into the Orinoco. Uh, instead, however, the ship lumbered for about five days off the coast of Suriname. It, it, wow. And it just kind of slowly moved westward um, because the either the mate or the bosun steered the ship southward out of the current. 
So it just kind of in this kind of still water mm. uh, and, it, and it moves slowly. It took days. And, and you know, and meanwhile, the, the mutineers, they don't know any different. They don't know this region. They don't mm. understand sailing. And so, you know, they're having a, gr- a good old time breaking open casks and finding all the gold and silver the captain and the merchant had <laughs> stashed away, breaking into chests. And not really, and, and the, the mate and the bosun are allowing them to do this to distract them, essentially. No, um, it, it's nuts yeah. because it's like stealing a car and then going, oops, I don't know how to drive. <laughs> exactly. it, 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 I mean, it's crazy. It's one of those dumb criminal things. Yeah, yeah it is. Yes. It's totally. <laughs> it really is. Like, and I, I try not to cast judgments, right? We don't know these guys that way. I don't know their mindsets that well. Yeah, but, all I can think about is like, this is yeah. like, like and, and it's also, you know, it, the other thing is, right, that it's to give dumb criminals, right? If, if their yeah. motive was to take this valuable cargo and go to Orinoco, uh, one of the most valuable car- part of the cargo was was chocolate, was cacao. And mm-hmm. that's what's grown in Venezuela. So there wouldn't have been a market for it they're had they arrived there. So they're bringing yeah. it back, but maybe the yeah. golden, you know, but, <laughs> yeah, but the, the ship is, and having a ship is also important to have, mm-hmm. but still... That's kind Not of if you don't like, know how to sail it by yourself. <laughs> I know. So, so the, the guy sailing it That's knew that funny. what they were doing, they were kind of slowing him down. Mm-hmm. They knew it. Yeah. They, they, they were going to deliberately. And, and what ends up happening is now, I don't know how deliberate this part of it is, but they come to about five days later to this mouth of a, of a very large river. And the, the mate actually says, it just has us in his testimony. He says, I, I told them this is the Orinoco. And if I'm, mm-hmm. if I'm wrong, you can cut my head off. Right, he tells them this, mm. to get them to go up this <laughs> river. Now, all the rivers on the northern coast of South America operate on the to go up and down them. You use the tides. So when the tide goes in, you go up river. When the tide goes out, you go down river. Um, and that's that's an important way to it's the it can actually move very quickly, and it's much more efficient to try to sail against the current. Um, mm-hmm. And or and you go twice as fast if you sail against the you know against the current when the tide's going out. So. They wait for the current to start going in, and like I said, you move very quickly as the as, or as the tide goes in up the up the river. They 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 just start sailing, and they keep sailing. Uh, this is June seventh, uh, seventeen forty three. Uh, just keep sailing sixty miles about, and there they come mm. to a house. And uh, then once again, the mate Uh-oh. kind of kind of <laughs> plays dumb, and he says, "Oh, we we can ask this person uh, if you know." What, what's going on and of course uh it's, it's very uh the the 60 miles going up river they're surrounded by jungle there's nothing it's just just mm. dense tropical lush jungle that, that's it and so and you know there's crocodiles too you know, oh, i'm just saying and snakes and, and piranhas and all piranha. that. yes a lot of piranha this is <laughs> this, this this region's known for piranha mm. and so they they go up and they get, and they don't see any, you know, any habitation, anything. And they get to until this house, um, and it's a, it's a fortified house. There's a little wall around it, and out of the house comes a group of men um, armed. And so uh-huh. the the mate mm-hmm. says, okay, we we should go talk to these men. And Fernando Fernando da Costa, uh, one of the, he's he's he is white, um, and so he he says, and he tells John Shaw this. Uh, he says that I'm the pretend I'm I'm the pretended captain. I'm the new captain. And so you all, and so I'm going to pretend to be this captain when we go meet. And so they leave John Shaw on board the ship, actually, because uh, uh, they, they, they have some concerns about him. Um, and so it's, it's the three mutineers, it's William Blake and the two young sailors. They row the ship's boat, the Rising Sun's boat ashore. And they're thinking these, they're in Orinoco. These are, this is some Spanish officer. They're going to start speaking Spanish. And the man speaks to them in Dutch. He greets them in Dutch. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> and they 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 parlay they can't communicate of course because none of them speak dutch um uh, uh, the sailors speak dutch but john shaw does so william blake says let me go back to the ship let me get john shaw let me get all my charts and my graphs and my books and we can map mm-hmm. this out he brings john shaw back and john shaw proceeds <laughs> to tell the the officer what <laughs> happened uh what's what's been happening in dutch um they actually <laughs> Day into the evening, I don't. They must have had supper together. I, I don't really know uh, mm. what what all transpired. But a little bit later in the evening, they go back to the ship, and it's at this moment the mutineers realize something's wrong, something's mm. off about this, and they decide. And the tide's going out, so they decide, oh, let's get out of here. Um, they the <laughs> um, the Joseph Perea, the the third mutineer, who I haven't talked a lot about because uh, we don't have his testimony. Um, so actually, he wanted to murder Blake and Shaw right there. He said, well, I, I, "We should kill them, then leave." But Perea kind of freaked, or uh, Decosta kind of freaked out. Said, "No, we can't. 
And as they're, they get this argument about what to do with these two ship's officers, realizing they're not in Orinoco, and this buys John Shaw time, who, who according, once again, to the testimony, he jumps out off, off, I mean, he's wounded, he's been cut to pieces, but he actually jumps out of the ship into the ship's boat and rows ashore uh, as they're arguing. He, he escapes. Wow, he managed to do, so they must have had a really good argument. They must have yeah. been a deep See, argument. this yeah. always happens in these yes, stories. I know, this, this is, is great. Yeah. This is crazy. <laughs> it is, it really is, <laughs> yeah, yes. Nice. Um, and so they freak out when Shaw gets away because they know this is the end. And they cut the anchor cable. Like they, they, someone said, they take their cutlass and cut the anchor cable. And now remember, the, the water's <laughs> rushing out. These guys don't know how to control the ship, so it's just going to go flying up the river, I mean, fly, going very quickly up the river. And unsurprisingly, it hits an island and runs aground about about five five miles up the river. Um, they get they get <laughs> loose. Flat tire. This yes. is really stupid criminals. <laughs> it is really is. <laughs> <laughs> Next morning, high tide comes in. The boat lifts. They're able to move again. Uh, they start to move uh, this uh, kind of with the current now, but slowly, and they run, actually run aground again. Um, <laughs> and it's the second time of running aground um, that Shaw and the, the the men, these Dutch men, are able to catch up with them. And it, the the Dutch man who was there, he was a he's a military officer named Jan Heis. And uh, Jan Heis, um, was, he had a few soldiers with him, but he was also a diplomat. He was important for maintaining the Dutch's relationship with uh, the indigenous people in that region, uh, trading and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so the reason it took them so long to respond was he actually sent out a call to all of his Native American allies to come to help them apprehend these mutineers. Wow. Um, oh, and so, so what the, <laughs> yeah. So what the, what the mutineers encountered, uh, what the, this river was, it's called the Quarantine River. And it's the, today the border between Suriname and Guyana. Um, oh. it's, a, it's a Dutch, it's, there's a Dutch outpost there. It's a Dutch, part of the Dutch colony. Um, the, the question is how familiar, Blake and Shaw were very familiar with the region. They would have probably known where they were and knew that they could get assistance there. Um, and so Jan Heiss gathers his, his, his men, gathers his uh, Indian allies, and they sail up the river um, and apprehend, uh, or they stop, they, 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 they capture the rising sun. Um, and in the midst of kind of boarding the ship and arresting the mutineers, Joseph Perea jumps off the ship and runs into the jungle. <laughs> um, and this is why we don't have his testimony because okay. now, now they had to now, now a manhunt's on, and so Jan Heiss has to hire a the, the corporal Heiss has to hire this uh, posse uh, to go hunt for him in the woods, in um, the jungle. And you know the these are not nice jungles. No, no, not nice oh, jungles. no, no, no. And it's, and it's and it's the wet season, so like early June, so oh. there's probably you know six inches of the water standing on the mm. rainforest with or snakes, snakes, mosquitoes. Mm. Oh, it would have mm. been oh. horrible. And he's mm. probably out there for, it takes about a week to, to find him. Um, wow. Yeah. Well, that guy and, did good then. <laughs> yeah. Well, he did, it did so well for him. Um, he's, so one of, the, <laughs> one of the fascinating things, just to tell you kind of how the kind of anger uh, the crew members had, the surviving crew members had against these mutineers, is that they're wounded, they're starved, right? Like it's been a hell of a, sorry, yeah. a, a really bad uh, you know, week for them. And they still agree to join the initial posse to hunt for Joseph Perea. Uh, so wow. William Blake's wounded, John Shaw wounded. They go into the jungle for a bit. They don't find him. Um, so they go back to the house with the post, with the, the post, um, with, the, with John Heist. And they did hire a posse to hunt for Joseph Perea. Uh, like I said, it takes probably about a week or so. Um, and they, they corner him, finally. Mm -hmm. the, the, these, it's all Native Americans. Um, they, they corner him. And he actually, uh, instead of uh, of surrendering, he he kills himself. He he stabs himself, and then this is um, crazy. Oh, it's and then of this course is the, crazy. the the po I said, yeah <laughs> the posse to collect their bounty have to prove they actually apprehended prey, so they cut off his head. Oh, and <laughs> and that's used as evidence in the case to show, and so it goes the the head goes to the the post, uh, and then it's sent to the capital <laughs> cert on Parbar Ibo for the trial to prove that he's been apprehended, and wow. that it's a piece of evidence in all of this. Wow, what was so it like it, researching this? I mean, this there. is insanity. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but you, yeah. you hold the head up by the hair in the court and say, "Here, I'd like to enter this as yeah. evidence." Yeah, that's exactly pretty like, much probably. Yeah, look at these exactly ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that's because it's an important piece of the the, the case. Yeah. Right? Why? Because you know, why is it there testimony from him? Well, it's because he's you know, this is what happened, and to prove that, that he had been apprehended and, and, and justice had been served, uh, just in a very different way. Yeah. The the documents were. I mean, 
it's, different languages too. Yes, and yes. I mean, you're talking about even just the way humans spoke and wrote. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not like Google search. No. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. So the 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 documents are either in English or Dutch. Um, the, the all the crew testimony, even in the Dutch records, the, all the crew testimonies in English. They were allowed to uh, enter okay. their their uh, their their testimony in English. It's been translated. Um, the the mutineers' testimony, though, which is one of the reasons I had to be kind of careful, and I try to use other evidence to corroborate what they're saying, is because they're speaking Portuguese to a translator who's speaking it speaking Dutch to a clerk who's scribbling down as fast as possible. Um, so there's going to be some mistranslation. There's going to mm -hmm. be some mis miswriting there. Sure. Um, and so, like I said, you try to corroborate uh, some of these details and facts just to make sure uh, wow. that, that yeah, it all matches up. This would make this a great to, movie. It would make a good movie. I think, <laughs> it, really I think would. It, it needs to go on Snoop Dogg's uh, new TV series of Dumb yeah. Criminals. Could you imagine? <laughs> I'm funny, you know? <laughs> Yeah, you know, but it, I'm sorry, I know history, we're not supposed to talk about Snoop. <laughs> but, but, no, no, it's great. No, mm. but I think, you know, it's, um, it's an insane story, but mm -hmm. you know, these, these mutinies really did happen a lot. And, mm -hmm. you know, that whole, you know, the whole East Coast is insane with, you know, we, we I was telling you about a book that we did an interview with recently. And it it's just insane about what it was like normally carrying wood like you're saying tobacco mm -hmm. things like that but mm -hmm. the living conditions of these mm -hmm. men i mm -hmm. mean being out to sea and there are things in the water i'm sorry mm -hmm. and it's cold not always mm -hmm. warm obviously yeah. when they're getting in south america it gets a little warm and you know snaky and mm -hmm. rainforesty and all that when you're on the land but to me to even to go through all the documentation and to find the documentation I mean, let's, how did you even find out about this story? And did mm. you know the full story when you started or like? Uh, no, it is a, <laughs> it, it was just, it just gradually kind of drew me in. And so um, as, as you, when you introduced me, you talked about, like, I, have, I have a first book, it's about slavery in 18th century Boston. And mm. I received it, so that's published 2016. And uh, in September 2016, um, the Old North Church and Historic Site in Boston uh, invited me to give a talk about the book. And uh, if you, the Old North Church is the so it's called the Paul Revere Church, or if it's the it's most famous because uh, when Paul Revere made his midnight ride to warn that the British oh, yeah. soldiers were marching mm -hmm. the night before the Battle of Lexington and Concord, it's where they hung the lanterns, right? The one if by see, oh. one if by land, two if by sea. That mm -hmm. that that's the that's the site, and and they've long kind of interpreted their own history as this kind of uh, this cradle of American liberty, this this central you know story in the founding of America, right? That's the, the signal part of his ride, which the next day was the opening battle of the War of Independence. And um, so I got an invitation to, to give a talk there. And cool. I, I was like, oh, cool. You know, and I, I wrote about Old North a little bit as a church and its first minister um, in, in, in Unfreedom. Uh, but when I came, they actually, of course, they were interested in the book and I gave my talk, but they were actually interested in Newark Jackson. Uh, they had I, they, they asked me, do you know who this is? And I said, I have no idea who Newark Jackson is. Uh, and it turns out I actually wrote about him in Unfreedom. I totally forgot, uh, blanked on that. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but but I read about him. And I, I in the context of owning slaves, and he'd owned uh, slaves in Boston. And so like, oh, well, we actually, oh, we actually opened a chocolate shop, a historic chocolate shop that's tied to our historic site um, that's, uh, that we named after him. Because we went through our records, and he was one of the earliest chocolatiers in, in America. Um, and so we named our shop after him. I said, oh, that, that's fascinating. They didn't know a whole lot about him. They had some details that he had been married. They knew he had children. Mm -hmm. They knew he was a ship captain. Um, but they, then they had this, uh, what was then kind of a, a, an apocryphal story, one they weren't sure it was true or just kind of myth, that he had been murdered in a mutiny in August 1743. Um, so a good friend of mine teaches at Leiden University of the Netherlands and studies smuggling and slavery uh, in Suriname. And so I just kind of wrote him and I said, hey, uh, are you from, have you heard of this guy? Do you know anything about him? Have you come across him in the records? And he wrote back, he said, oh yeah, there he is. He's, he's a smuggler. He shows up a couple of times in the records in Suriname. Mm -hmm. And so that's where he was getting the chocolate. He's buying it in Suriname. Wow, so he, here's your yeah. fancy chocolatier and he's a smuggler. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's a smuggler. In addition to being a chocolatier and so a chocolatier. Did, what, yeah. what, so was he originally from England because of the- No, he, that's like, mm -hmm. like, we don't actually have, I don't, I was not able to find where he was born more likely than not he's from massachusetts he's probably from essex mm -hmm. county uh marblehead okay. or salem or someplace like that 
uh, so just north of Austin. Uh, so he's a native New Englander. Um, mm -hmm. His family had probably been there for a couple generations by the time uh, he was born in the about 1705 or so. Wow, well, this, this could is, just be titled uh, "Death by Chocolate." Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> I just, I just hear this song. I'm shipping off to Boston. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I lost well, that, my life. Yeah. He lost his yeah. wooden leg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is this is crazy. I mean, going through the records and then you know start. It, mm -hmm. This is a rabbit hole. So, you, oh, yeah. you, so you're the mm. first person to really piece this whole thing together as one big story. And wow, that's yeah, a lot I, of work. Yeah, and so because you know, the I emailed my friend, and then he emails back and said, "Yes, yes, there's Jackson." And then he emailed back just a couple of days later, and the, and the subject line of the email was "murder!" exclamation point, And he found the trial records <laughs> the, cool. of the mid who, of, of the mute beers, and so we had their transcripts and we had the testimony, and so it's and that's when I realized, like, oh wow, there's a much bigger story here that's not being that hasn't been told that no one's really talked about or mm. known about. Um, what can we do with it? Um, and so this, this led to this sort of multi-year project uh, where the book is one, one part of the project. Uh, what we actually received funding from uh, Mars Wrigley Confectionery, so Mars Chocolate uh, Corporation. They, were, uh, they, they, weren't, they weren't smugglers, right? No, 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 no. They, they started far after this period. Um, yeah, he, he, was, he was a smart dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so they actually, uh, they, they provided a, a substantial grant, the, the Forest D. Mars Cho a Junior Chocolate History Grant uh, to oh. embark hmm. on this research. And, it, it, and so really, in a lot of ways, it, it's different from my other work um, as, a, as an academic because I was more of a project manager. I hired researchers um, and, and the researchers built, uh, they, they gathered records for the Old North Church. And as part of the grant, I said I would write. I'd write something. I didn't know if there was a book there yet or not uh, when we started, but very quickly realized there was enough there for a book. Um, wow. and, and so I had I had researchers. I, I did some of the research. I did some research in London. I did a lot of the, the print record research. Uh, but I also I hired a, a research assistant in Boston, um, a research assistant in uh, Essex County, um, just north of, of Boston, and then also a research assistant in the Netherlands. And mm -hmm. she she kind of systematically went through all these Dutch records. And found there's quite a bit of, uh, especially in the official records of CERN on the governor's journals of the uh, of, of wow. the court records um, and some other records of, of this case. Wow. You know, but I was thinking back from the other book I read on different mutinies, and I think I can safely say when you're hiring your your shipmates or hands, never hire three that know each other. <laughs> it's a yeah. bad idea. Yeah. It's a bad, yeah. bad idea. Because it just seemed like every meeting there's these three guys mm -hmm. who know each other. And then it, it all comes together later. And they it, they really were brutal. I mean, mm -hmm. there doesn't nobody seems to have I mean any the, the idea about, of swords. Swords yeah, and axes. I mean, and oh, yeah. tossing them over and oh yeah. This know, is more of like, a massacre. Too. Oh, you yeah. know? It's, absolutely. It's, yes. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's horrific. I mean, it's, it really is. It, it, the thing is, is as I what I like to talk about is that it, it, it's also reflective of an incredibly violent world that, the, oh, yeah. that they, they live in. Um, you know, this is a world where slavery is at the center of the mm -hmm. economy and slavery is forced labor that rests upon violence. Um, these, these mutineers had been active in the slave trade where they, part of their job was inflicting violence. And so this is just a world that's, that's so incredibly violent in a way that, that, that's so different than our own world. Uh, and, it, and, and that's the, the actual act of the mutiny is reflective of that, that violent world. Okay, so you so can, what happens if you when were, we... Sorry, go I was ahead. say, if, if you were a slave and you're all chained down mm -hmm. in the hull of the it's ship horrible. and all this stuff is going oh. on on deck, Dude, and you have, I, really, you have no idea. I, I can't imagine because what's even worse yeah. is that, like, like, so the ship had already been to Suriname, so the main portion of the cargo had been sold. So most of the captives have been sold. So what are what's left mm. is, and this is the, the, the kind of cruel language of the slave trade would be called remainders. Um, and remainders tended to be people that were passed over on the first go around. Um, so a lot of people who were kind of considered uh, labor, people who were considered undesirable as laborers, so children, older people, people with certain physical defects and things. And, and so the 15 that are on board, 13 of them are actually children. Mm -hmm. They're probably between about 10 and 12, 10 and 13 years of age. Yes, and they, yes. they would have experienced this. They would have heard the screams. They would have mm -hmm. the shouting, the, the stabbing. They would have seen the, the, the merchant's clerk, you know, cut to pieces, crawling through the hole through where they were. I mean, really? 
it would have been yeah it would have been horrific mm -hmm. Traumatic. Can you think about traumatic. like even in the Revolutionary War and back in those days when we had the little drummer boy going mm -hmm. out there? I mean, there's these young kids in war, you know, and yeah. just, you know, and you think also like even during that war, you know, and, and the Civil War, where, you know, this still freaks me out about our history of, hey, let's, you know, blow up a farmyard, like the mm -hmm. farmland, and here's these women and kids. Mm -hmm. you know, hiding at the, in the basement of the house the next morning, wake up and your farm is covered in dead bodies. Mm -hmm. That's got to yeah. be like horrific for the kids to mm -hmm. experience. And I wonder what happens generationally with that kind of trauma, because it is mm -hmm. trauma. It's traumatic. Oh, it is. Sure. It, it, so it, how it, it goes yeah, down. Yeah, absolutely. And as I talk about the book, like this is just one of many traumas for these, these mm -hmm. children. Many of them were probably born in Africa. They had been, mm -hmm. you know, trafficked already within Africa, sold to European slave traders who would have taken them to Barbados. They're mm -hmm. held and then put on board the Rising Sun, go to Suriname, only to then experience this mutiny. And so this is it's just like trauma upon trauma upon trauma for these for these children. And like, yeah. we don't, like, you know, I don't know any of their names, the children. I know one of the, there was a, two young men, or adult, young adult men, and one of their names is Cirrus. But other than that, I don't, I don't know their names. Wow. I just know they were boys and girls. That's how they're described. And the, and the Dutch term used to describe them, they're about, like I said, about 10 to 13 years of age. And, a, and then in this country, I mean, later on, it's their, their livestock. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're not human, you know, That's, they're not yes. documented that way, which is, which is, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's horrific. Which is exactly how why would, they're not well documented here, right? Because they're considered, yeah, they're, a, they're, they're property, we bought and sold. That's what's wow. got to be so hard about doing research, you know, mm -hmm. and once in a while you get that and maybe with DNA now, mm -hmm. things can get a little bit better depending, but how far, you know, it's like, what, can you yeah. go get that guy's head and <laughs> get his <laughs> yeah. hair off his head, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, you yeah. know, but, um, you know, when America comes into being founded, like here we comes America, it's what, 20 something years later, right? You've got to think, okay, all of this smuggling is going on. And, and slavery, is that part of anything as the, you know, the, the founding fathers, not, no women allowed mm -hmm. in the club, did any of that come into play like we shouldn't be doing this or is it still like whatever floats your boat? Mm -hmm. Like I was just thinking, because in Louisiana, they have mm -hmm. this area called the, uh, the neutral strip mm -hmm. where it was like free for all for everybody. You know, nobody knew who owned what of the mm -hmm. Louisiana Purchase in that area. There was no law and order and smuggling mm -hmm. and privateers were having a field day. And yep. it's like where everybody could go hang out and not get caught. So that's kind of where my mind is going with, mm -hmm. with what was it like when the country was founded and all this stuff was going on? Like, yeah, well, we, we had to kind of separate those two out, right? Mm -hmm. Smuggling and slavery. And in terms of smuggling, right? Well, this is one of the main grievances the Americans have against the British government is that mm -hmm. the British trade laws were so restricted. Um, the things that we think of as everyday stuff, sugar, coffee, tea, all of it's heavily, it's like, it, it's illegal to, tr to purchase it from outside the empire, even if it's cheaper. And you're, you're happy. So that way you have to buy it through all sorts of middlemen and it drives up costs and it, you know, actively mm -hmm. hurts trade and stuff like that. And so one of the founding kind of principles and animating principles of the revolution is this right to free trade and that, that people should have the right to do commerce wherever they see mm -hmm. it without restriction um and, and what should be targeted are certain goods that need to be you know have be taxed in certain ways say like alcohol or something like that or that that shouldn't be allowed to be traded at all right so that it's to target very specific goods but otherwise just for normal everyday trade it should be unrestricted People should just mm. kind of be able to. So this is mm. so. And so, of course, most of our quote unquote founding fathers were inveterate smugglers. They, they, they John Hancock, right? Is it like that's what he's known for that. Um, and so they, for them, free trade is this kind of founding principle and animating principle. Um, mm. Slavery, however, mm. is uh, is a little bit of a different story because uh, they, on the one hand, uh, a lot of the these these men who, who found the United States are slave owners. Uh, they. Uh, George Washington, James Madison, Thomas right. Jefferson, they all own mm -hmm. it, right? Um, but on the other hand, there are these ideas that come in, the, the, the revolution does kind of bring into being and, make, and popularize about the evils of slavery, that it needs to be ended. Um, and so it builds this kind of contradiction into the, into the heart of that, that revolution, um, a, a number of contradictions, right? So on the one hand, if we think about that these guys, they advocate for free trade, they, they advocate for their freedom from Great Britain, yet they own slaves on the one hand. Yeah. Um, 
but also contradictions <laughs> within the people themselves, like someone like Thomas Jefferson, who doesn't like slavery, but needs it for his own economic uh, survival. Um, and, and so that it creates that kind of contradiction at the heart and that, that kind of the contradiction between or paradox, I guess, between slavery and liberty. That's what comes out of the American Revolution. That's wow. it's fascinating. I, you know, with us traveling full time, we document parks and public lands and mm -hmm. they're not all Yosemites. There's a lot yeah. of yeah. history that we're, <laughs> we're covering in, in parks. And, and by the way, Yosemite has a huge amount of history, too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's um, it's really fascinating going to different regions and all of a sudden when we were back east this was because we were out of you know based out of tucson and southern mm -hmm. california and, and you know the southwest all of a sudden we're like holy cow this this just got real like going this to gettysburg real, real. and places oh, yeah. like that yeah. you're like yeah. oh my gosh we haven't done boston yet but we'll yeah. be there we're we're, we're going to be what we're doing maryland soon oh, in, the, in the next month or so so we're getting there but mm -hmm. it's it's that history is so like wow we're we're in a whole different I can't mm -hmm. explain it. It's just completely different when than mm -hmm. when you're on the west or the southwest side, yes. and you dig into that. And when you go to some of the cemeteries, you're looking at Revolutionary War heroes, mm -hmm. and you're like, "Wow, you know, you you rarely see that in the Southwest, mm -hmm. you know, even though yeah. some of them did travel out, you know." Yeah, yeah, that's been one of the big. So I, I live on the West Coast. I live in the, the Northwest, and that's I lived in Boston beforehand. That's been one of the big changes of the way in which that history is inscribed in the landscape in a way in, in the east these this, this earlier history that I, I say of course there's history out here too but it's a it's a very different sort of history and especially you know confronting these issues of, of slavery is it, 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 like you can't really avoid it even in a place like boston right so you, you think about some place like faneuil hall where uh we think about it it's literally called the cradle of liberty uh yet peter faneuil the man who endowed it was a slave trader uh he owned enslaved people um, Old North, right? Once again, this kind of bastion of, li mm. of, of liberty, um, this story that, that, I, that I tell in the book has, has kind of caused them uh, to confront that past. And like, how do we tell both stories? It is certainly a cradle of liberty, without question, right? It's so important, the, the, the coming of American mm. independence. Uh, but on the other hand, most of the people that, that were congregants there in the 18th century uh, owned slaves, the, the prominent mm. congregants, they owned slaves. The entire building, it's, it's bells, it's steeple, are, are built uh, on the contributions of slave owners and people who profited from slavery. So how do you balance that history? And this is this mm. is what these these sorts of sites are, are really having to work with, uh, you know, work through and kind of confront. So it, it's, you know, it's one thing to say slavery existed, to acknowledge that there is this kind of reckon with the past. No, slavery existed, that it, mm. we, it, it, it did this and this, and these people associated with our place were involved with it. It's another, that, well, what do you do with that information? What, mm -hmm. what is it, mm -hmm. how do you present that to the public? How do you interpret that for the public? How do you incorporate that into educational programming for say fifth graders, right? Like these are really tough questions mm -hmm. when you confront this past about how do you, how do you work through this? Yeah, I think we're really there. You know, even when you look at all the statues <laughs> mm -hmm. being pulled down, like, mm -hmm. you know, we went to Galveston, mm -hmm. Texas, cause I was doing this, I was going to get, we're following the story of Cabeza de Vaca. Mm -hmm. And a crazy story. I mean, oh, that's a talk yeah. about <laughs> another shipwreck, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, let's run through the desert and die. Yeah, you know, cool. it's, it's crazy. <laughs> but, sounds good so to it, me. You yeah. know? One of his, his uh, plaques, are, it was in Galveston. <laughs> so I'm trying to find the plaque. I find, you know, here's this, it was outside the courthouse, I think. And it was like the circle of all these statues and mm -hmm. people and everything. And here's his little teeny thing. And he's yeah. known as <laughs> the first travel writer of Texas. And I'm like, yeah. What you yeah. just gave? You didn't talk about this whole you share like, little tiny dude. square. I know. I got all mad. I was like, we drove yeah. all the way here just for that, you know. <laughs> Here's this statue of this guy, mm -hmm. and I'm like, who's that? Well, they took the the name off the plaque because he owned slaves, and so here's all this history. But now I don't know who the guy is, mm -hmm. and I'm going, okay, look, we don't like what these yeah. people did, and and I have photos of statues all across the country that have been pulled down we need to somehow interpret mm -hmm. the good and the bad and showcase both and realize it, 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 it's not right what they did at all. It's, it's no, if horrific. you take it down, but, it's almost like saying slavery never happened. So we're having a hard time. So like, how do you, yeah. I think our park systems, our national park service has done a really good job yeah. when you go into these historic sites and monuments and mm -hmm. um, interpreting where they're not mm -hmm. telling you what to believe. Mm -hmm. They're, well, they're like, not here's saying the fact. honor. It's not, you know, like yeah, some not... of the, 
they're not because some of those statues that you find in town squares they like say Jackson this the mm -hmm. plaque will always say in honor of yeah, yeah that's whereas wrong. when you go to the national parks or they just pretty much present the truth mm -hmm. and they don't honor anybody mm -hmm. yeah. this is what happened this is what mm -hmm. it happened and this is the result of it that's yeah. pretty much straight up and but the city town you know town squares with their founding fathers mm. you know if you just redid the plaques i don't think they should tear the statues down they just need to take the plaques and reword them mm -hmm. mm. yeah you i know? mean this is uh yeah I, I, i'm currently working with daniel hall there's going to be an exhibit mm. put in on mount boston and its connections with slavery and the slave trade and i'm, I'm, I'm working on that project um oh, and cool. and one of the you know, we've done tons of focus groups. And one of the things that comes out of these focus groups is that people want a complicated history, right? That it's, there's always this assumption that people can't handle a complicated past, that, that people can do good things and bad things, right? That they, you know, they, they, they there's, there's a much more, it's a much grayer picture. It's not black and white, right? Um, but one of the things that's come out of these focus groups is that, that people want the whole story. They want the complicated story. They want the complicated truth. And so Fanny mm -hmm. Hall makes a really great example of this because here you have a man who was, you know, he was the wealthiest man in Boston when he died in 1743. Um, and he was, a lot of that wealth was built on slavery and the ownership of, of enslaved people uh, and the slave trade. But on the other hand, you know, he, he was the child of refugees. Uh, and his, his family really made their money uh, the old, hard, fashioned way. He inherited it from his, his uncle and his father, but they, they worked hard, right? They, and they made something of themselves after being kicked out of France, um, being exiled. Yeah. Um, that he was a great philanthropist, and he he in debt, he tried, you know he provided this hall Crazy. for the, the town. He he provided for education opportunities, funded an orphanage, right? And so, but he also profited from slavery. So it's a it's really kind of complicated path. Yeah, it is. And I and I think you know there is I, I think there's a lot of times when we think about the kind of public history when we think about the way we tell talk about history with the public. Uh, do with heritage, or sometimes heritage, so there's no memory, right, whatever you want to call it. Um, there is this desire to simplify as if people can't handle complicated narratives, but that's not the feedback we've gotten in all of this. Mm, work. That's they, great to know. They, they, want the they want the complex. They, they want, want complicated the people and stories and the truth. Yeah, because that, the yeah. past is complicated. That is the truth. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that's what's so important about what you're doing and that you're, you know, documenting history mm -hmm. and letting us, you know, read it, interpret it, mm -hmm. even doing the podcast so people can hear what, wow, this stuff happened so that there's an understanding of mm -hmm. what was it like, you know, always think about, oh, slaves on a ship. Yeah, they came by ship and then this, this, this happened. Mm -hmm. But it, their journey, what slaves went through started way before they got here, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like the, the, the pain and the mm -hmm. suffering that they went through. And this is something that happened in every single country in the world. I mean, it's, this is not just America. It's not, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, we lived in Africa. And mm -hmm. the, I mean, even South Africa hid mm -hmm. what happened, what mm -hmm. the British mm -hmm. did to the Dutch. I mean, they, yeah. they, it, there's all that history was hidden. Even when I was in school there, mm -hmm. it was hidden. And so it's, we have to reckon it because I don't think if we don't, we can't fix things if yes. it's not there. And yeah. human exactly. beings are complicated. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, it's like yeah. you could really like someone for what they do and then really go, but they suck at this over here. They were <laughs> yeah. rude or mm -hmm. something, you mm -hmm. know, so it's it's fascinating. But yes. thank you so much for oh. joining us. Uh, real pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, well, thank yeah, you, Lisa. Nancy. This is great. Yeah, thanks for the conversation. I, I really appreciate it. That's and everyone, fine. the book is out mm -hmm. now. Again, it's by Jared R. Hardesty, and it is called Mutiny on the Rising Sun, A Tragic Tale of Slavery, Smuggling, and... Mm -hmm chocolate it's out by uh, nyu press so you can get it now amazon bookshop.org just saying gotta go there uh, get it from your independent bookstores if you can and of course keep up with us at bigblendradio.com we do want to give a special shout out to today's sponsor which is norfolk tours in england uh, glenn burrows is on our show every mm -hmm. Is it every third Saturday, every fourth Saturday talking mm. about English ties to America and Canada and around the world? That's what I was asking you. I'm like, <laughs> he takes people over to England and takes them around to find their family history. And when you think cool. about the Northeast, mm, cool. you know, mm -hmm. we've been doing shows with him about, you know, Vancouver and oh, wow. I mean, everybody, yeah. Thomas Paine, talk about a complex story. Mm -hmm. Thomas Paine is one of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's really cool. So everyone, norfolk-tours.co.uk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.